Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 242, recorded on May 25th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start this week with an almost cliche kernel release from Linus Torvalds, announcing Linux 5.18. Linus wrote in the 5.18 announcement, no unexpected nasty surprises this last week. So here we go with the 5.18 release right on schedule, and that obviously means that the merge window for 5.19 will open tomorrow. No surprises, perhaps, but there have been some controversial additions. 5.18 brings the first wave of support for Intel's software-defined silicon, or SDSI, functionality. The purpose of which is to disable access to specific processor capabilities in the absence of a certificate from Intel saying otherwise. Yeah, my brain almost has a hard time believing the words coming out of your mouth, Wes, but it is all true, and it's all GPL, so that's good, right? No, it leaves us feeling uneasy. But here's what we do know. David Box, who submitted the patch set, he made at least one aspect of this clear. The interface to the mechanism itself is relatively simple. It's not like Intel's doing anything weird on your Linux box. What happens is this system appears as a device on the bus that offers a couple of operations install an authentication key certificate, or a capability activation payload. So the certificate is used to authenticate any request to enable a feature, while the payload actually contains the requests themselves. And unless this device has been used to store an acceptable certificate and payload, the features that it governs will be unavailable to software that is running on this new Intel CPU. This new SDSI hardware also maintains a couple of counters that it uses to track how many times you've tried and failed to load a certificate or enable a feature. And, well, if you exceed the threshold for those counters, the mechanism will be disabled entirely. No new shiny features for you unless you power cycle your box. Yep, and uh, uh, Intel says that this is great because it's a system that enables shipping cheaper CPUs with features that could be of interest to users down the road, but are just unavailable until the additional payments are made. Um, yeah, I mean, to be clear, at this stage, we don't really know what those features are going to be, so that will be worth waiting for. But we do know at this point, the Linux support should be ready. And as for me, well, I'll be ready to vote with my wallet. Looking ahead to Linux 5.19, ButterFS users are in for a fresh treat. David Sturba of SUSE has submitted almost 4,000 lines of code with some exciting new features for one of our favorite file systems. Indeed, and surprise, surprise, performance has been the focus of a lot of this patch set. This is probably the fruits of a lot of low-level code optimizations by various groups at SUSE, Facebook, and some other large supporters. What are you getting for all that effort? Well, starting in 519, ButterFS will now avoid blocking on space reservation. That's a change that should see about a 7% throughput improvement for both reads and writes. There's also been some improvements to locking code when you're using the no copy on write option. That's about a 3% throughput performance improvement. And there's a nice to see improvement in the ButterFS send code. They've reduced pressure on the page cache there by dropping extent pages sooner. The list just keeps going on here. We're not going to go into all of them here on the show, but it's well worth checking out in the notes. And I, I've got to think, you add up all these small little pieces, it's going to be some performance improvements you can feel. Yeah, how often does that happen? Something gets created, and then each release, it just gets better and faster. I mean, I feel like at this point, ButterFS is becoming one of the better turnaround stories in free software. It's really gotten good. And it's just great to see that the network effect of its adoption is really paying off. If you haven't tried out ButterFS for a laptop install, maybe a Raspberry Pi, it's, it's worth a go. Hans Christoph Steiner, aka 8 have shared a noteworthy update this week on the F-Droid infrastructure. And included some nice improvements for developers submitting apps and just for us end users. Absolutely. And for those of you out of the loop, F-Droid is a free alternative to Google Play. It's um, something focused on free software. You could uh, perhaps load it on a device that has no Google services. And more and more apps are co-publishing in F-Droid or perhaps some apps are only publishing there. 
As you can imagine, running something like this over time, it sort of gets built organically, and it requires a big pile of automation to manage the process of building thousands of apps from source. Yeah, I mean, think about that for a moment. You gotta check out the source repos for all of those apps. You gotta check to see if they've been updated. You gotta actually go through and build them, make a new release, securely sign them, that's pretty tricky as well. And then, of course, make sure that they get put into your test infrastructure, spin up a virtual machine, make sure that they still work. And yeah, all of that has sort of been built over the many years F-Droid has existed. And it's all running on Debian. But no, not the latest release of Debian, of course not. It's an old install of Debian. Like five years old, uh, Debian Stretch, I think? <laughs> yeah, is that old in Debian terms? I think it's getting there. Um, and you can understand, right? Because upgrading to more recent releases, that's not like a, a simple app dash get upgrade. It's a lot more complicated. And the project says they also need to overhaul their build process to get there. And that's tricky because they really need to provide a platform to build those thousands of apps. They can't just upgrade the base image as often as they might like. Ain't that the truth? But work is underway, even if it's going to take some time. Thankfully, though, this is nice to see Calyx Institute, who builds Calyx OS in F-Droid. They're sponsoring 42 hours a month of time dedicated to improving the build infrastructure and improving automation more generally. And you developers out there, well, you'll be happy to hear that the outcome of some of this process should be faster application submission and improved signing automation. That maybe opens up some possibilities for parallelizing the whole thing submission process. Google has announced the Summer of Code 2022 project winners, and the list actually includes more than a few names that you probably know. Debug Point News has done a nice job of listing out the ones most folks would be interested in, but there were a few that stood out to us, including FFmpeg. Google sponsoring some work on a high-throughput JPEG 2000 decoder, as well as some work to enable CUDA C++ support. Another lucky project this year is Debian, where the primary focus is going to be trying to complete the Android SDK and Debian's packaging base. Well, you gotta have that. There's also some summer fun coming to Tor, LibreOffice, the GNOME desktop. Uh, one that I thought was interesting is it looks like there's a project to sync GNOME Health app with Apple Health, Nextcloud, and other apps. I don't think I even knew there was a GNOME Health app, so that's interesting. There's also a project to add Chromecast support to GNOME Network Display. Yes, please. I know, right? Yeah, I think they have Mirrorcast now. And really just several other nice-to-see things for GNOME, some Nautilus stuff. Uh, but don't worry. Plasma's getting some summer fun, too, if you're a desktop of the Plasma variety user. Nothing too exciting, though. Nothing that really jumped out at me. But we will have the full breakdown and a link to the Debug Point news article in our show notes, because it's not just those projects. There's a bunch of others getting some love, like XOR, GIMP, VLC, etc. So go to linuxactionnews.com slash 242 for a link to that. Well, we all knew it would happen eventually. This week, Canonical announced that Ubuntu 2210, which is shipping in the fall, will switch to Pipewire by default as its audio server. Now, technically, we should note here that Ubuntu already includes Pipewire. 2204 LTS, for instance, ships with both Pipewire and Pulse Audio installed. But it's mainly included for Wayland compatibility, you know, all that fancy new stuff, and not in use currently as the default server. But starting with the next release, that finally changes. Lino.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and that's where you go to support the show. Linode offers options for developers and businesses that don't want the complexities of hyperscalers and don't need their endless options either. You know, they're always trying to lock you into their esoteric platform. And I feel like Linode is the jetpack for my business. Seriously, it lets me compete with the likes of Spotify. I can deliver an on-par experience with Linode's infrastructure at pricing that my business can actually afford. And their pricing is 30 to 50% cheaper than the major hyperscalers out there. And they've been doing this for nearly 19 years, iterating on making the best platform to run your applications. Everything we've built in the last couple of years, we built it on Linode. 
And we've learned that they have the best customer support in the business. And this is the number one signal I hear from the audience. Hey, Chris, yeah, they got me with the performance, but then I had this problem and the support was unbelievable. Tier one support when you pick up the phone or you send them a message or a ticket, 365 a year, they're working on it for you. And on top of that, they just have some of the best performance with 11 data centers around the world. They are their own ISP, so they have just the fantastic bestest internet ever. <laughs> I mean, it's it's so much fun to mess around with, I have to say. And then they have great features that we use, like object storage, their cloud firewall, their backups, and so much more. And the dashboard makes managing all of this straightforward and simple. So if you're just looking for like a portfolio or a gaming server, they can do that. But if you're looking to run the back end of your business and you want to scale up to millions of users, yeah, they absolutely do that as well. Go build something, go try something, go learn something and support the show. Go to linode.com slash LAN, get that $100 in 60 day credit and go kick the tires for yourself while you support the show. Linode.com slash LAN. And a tremendous thank you to Ting for their sponsorship of Linux Action News. Linux.ting.com. Are you sick of overpaying for your cell service? <laughs> yeah. Go see how much you could save and then take 25 bucks off of that when you go to Linux.ting.com. Ting is a mobile virtual network operator. That means they focus on the customer relationship, the value, and they ride on top of the existing network built by the big mega nationwide carriers. You know who I'm talking about, and Ting utilizes their networks, the same fast LTE and 5G, but you interface with Ting, who was recently named the number one carrier by Consumer Reports, and you save a bunch of money. Their plans are simple and straightforward, and there's no contracts ever. And Ting's customer service, of course, it's up there. And those, those like little things all come together, like simple plans, great pricing, network access, multiple network access, I might add. Support, all of it just comes together to create a fantastic experience. That's why I've been a Ting customer since 2013, for reals. Go check them out. Go to linux.ting.com, plans that are really competitively priced and easy to understand. And if you ever get stuck, they'll help you. And you can do it all online. And pretty much any phone's going to work with Ting. So just head to linux.ting.com, check your current phone, create an account, and pick the plan that's right for you. linux.ting.com. And we end this week on a rumor that could change the industry. Bloomberg and others are reporting that within the next week, Broadcom could announce an agreement to acquire VMware at least according to people familiar with the matter. Absolutely a big deal. And you'll recall in 2016, Dell acquired EMC, which owned VMware at the time, for an historic $67 billion, still one of the largest acquisitions in tech history. And after five years of being part of Dell, VMware was then spun out in November of 2021 with an agreement to continue to work together with Dell for the next five years. Now, also along with that, Dell CEO, Michael Dell, owns approximately 41% of VMware. He plays a critical role still at the company as chairman of the board of VMware. So he's going to have a say in whatever happens here. And VMware currently has a market valuation of around $50.3 billion. The takeover discussions are ongoing, but there's also no guarantee that the talks actually lead to an agreement. Representatives for the two companies didn't immediately respond to requests for comment. But the Wall Street Journal does note that the bid could be around $140 a share, or totaling $60 billion. Wow, I mean, $60 billion's a lot. <laughs> There's no, no getting around that. But it's interesting because it's not really what Dell originally paid for VMware back in the day. Intel's chief executive officer, Pat Gelsinger, told Bloomberg TV, he has uh, mixed feelings about the potential acquisition. And he does have some standing to comment. Gelsinger was VMware CEO for eight years before recently returning to Intel. First, it's a rumor. You know, right. I'm uh, you know, happily reading the newspapers like you uh, on that. But, you know, for us, you know, I, you know, I'm excited about VMware being an innovative partner for the future. And any potential transaction for them, I'd want to make sure that innovation is alive and well. And while that's not a strong condemnation or really a strong endorsement, I would say as far as CEO speak goes, it's rather bearish on the idea overall. That's probably reflective of how we're all feeling right about now. Of course, VMware is also a platinum member of the Linux Foundation. So whatever happens here could impact that. 
A platinum member pays around the tune of $500,000 a year for the title. So we're going to keep an eye on this and everything else happening in the world of Linux and open source news because there will be knock-on effects. So be sure you go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. And don't miss the new show, Office Hours at officehours.hair. It's a podcast made just for the Jupiter Broadcasting community. If you're not a JB listener, don't tune in. It's not recommended for you. Officehours.hair. But hey, you can still find this show back every single week with the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks so much for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. 